Um, he did not invent the telephone. Um, that's John McCarthy. Uh, he's one of the founders of the area of artificial intelligence and um, the one who made up the name, um, calling it artificial intelligence. And his definition is getting computers to do things which, when done by people, are said to involve intelligence. And he defined it that way uh, to make it clear that the field um, is not um, a branch of philosophy. They're not, they're not doing you know, epistemology about what does it mean to think and what does it mean to know something and all of that, and, and can computers have consciousness. He's finessing all of that and saying, uh, we want to get computers to do hard problems. Um, and that's really what the field is about. So just for example, um, back when I was an undergraduate in the 60s, uh, people were starting to write computer programs to uh, play chess. Um, and they weren't all that good back then. Um, mainly because computers were slow. And by slow, we mean millions of operations per second instead of billions or trillions. Um, so it doesn't seem slow to me, but uh, it's slow enough that um, the computer programs of that day were only so-so chess players. Um, and uh, actually, a, a Berkeley professor of philosophy named Hubert Dreyfus um, famously wrote a book called What Computers Can't Do, in which he, he predicted that computers would never be very good at playing chess. Um, well, as you probably know, uh, the world's chess champion is now a computer. Um, computers routinely beat even the best human players. Um, but the way the computers, the chess playing programs, choose where to move everyone agrees is totally different from the way human beings do it. So basically, it's, the computers do it with just brute computational force, start with the current chessboard, and figure out every possible move I can make, and then figure out every possible move the other guy can make, and so on, until you run out of time, and then pick the best result for yourself um, after doing that. And uh, it's really only because computers have gotten faster and not because of any brilliant new insight that computers have gone from being mediocre chess players um, to being, uh, you know, really excellent chess players. By the way, uh, it's worth noting in passing that um, people who question the enterprise of artificial intelligence um, set pretty high standards. So uh, Seymour Papert, one of my computer education heroes, um, made up the name uh, the superhuman human fallacy, uh, by which he means that critics of artificial intelligence aren't happy with mediocre chess players. They only will um, concede defeat if you have world champion chess players, um, whereas most human beings are at best mediocre chess players. Most human beings aren't chess players at all. So, um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, a little bit ahead of the story about critiques of AI, but um, nevertheless, it makes the point that our job is not to do an exact simulation of human beings. So in artificial intelligence, the object of the exercise is just to solve hard problems. Um, another, by the way, is it's turning out that what people think of as hard problems, like playing chess, uh, seem to be the ones that yield themselves most readily to um, just computer speed and power. Um, and the really hard artificial intelligence problems that researchers are working on now are things like walking on an irregular surface, something that you do absolutely without thinking about it, that everybody can do. Um, and those are the ones that are especially hard to... Um, 
work out computer programs for. Um, maybe partly because uh, people don't think so much about how they do it. And so we can't just use introspection to work it out. OK. Um, OK, so a little bit of computer history. Um, there have been machines to do specific calculations. Um, an important example is calculations of planetary orbits for thousands of years. But uh, people generally date the idea of the programmable computer, um, which could do more than one computation, to Charles Babbage's difference engine, um, which he proposed in 1822 and never actually built. Um, because basically they didn't have the um, ability to make small precise parts in, in bulk that was needed for this uh, entirely mechanical computing device. Um, in 1991, the London Science Museum uh, built a difference engine um, based on Babbage's drawing. They actually built a few of them. Uh, this is one of them. Two? OK, two of them. Um, so there it is. That's the first um, programmable computer. So almost immediately, people started asking questions about can computers think, um, which we still aren't answering. What does that do? What, the difference engine? Yeah. Um, basically, solve differential equations. It, it sort of does repeated arithmetic computations. So you set up. Um, an iteration like, um, OK, simple example. You know the Fibonacci numbers, where each one is the sum of the two before it? So that's an iterated computation, where the iteration is take the two previous things and add them up. So the, the difference engine can do iterated computations like that, but more complicated. And it's called the difference engine because you take this value and this value and see the difference between them and use that to adjust the next step. So like when you turn it on, what, what do you think you'll... Oh, before you turn it on, you have flipped a bunch of switches and um, stuck, was it card? I think I actually had some kind of card thing, if I'm remembering correctly, um, to control it. Just card output. Card output, maybe not output, not input, OK. Um, yeah, maybe it's just widgets that you push and you pull this lever up and this one down and you set up the computation that way and then you start cranking. These days you do the cranking electrically, maybe, but uh, I think in those days it was just mechanical cranking. Um, so it was useful for scientists who need numerical solutions to differential equations. Um, this guy is Herman Hollerith. Um, he invented uh, a machine that read holes in punch cards, um, which when I was growing up was the way you gave input to computers mostly. And he built this machine to carry out the 1890 US census, um, where you know they ask you all these questions about how much money do you make and how many people in your family and what race are you and what sex are you and all that. And they ca tabulate those things using Hollerith's machine. And uh, he founded the company that uh, later became IBM. So I'm doing this uh, past history um, because Babbage's machine and Hollerith's machine were both programmable. So you could tell them what computation to perform. But they were entirely about numbers. Calculation was always numeric, some kind of um, solving equations or uh, adding up how many of this and how many of that, doing statistical computations. And that's how computers were in general um, before artificial intelligence researchers introduced the idea of symbolic computing. Um, what they wanted to do was do computation on ideas. So um, you could, for example, have rules um, like, Oh, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, crank, 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 Socrates is mortal. That kind of computation uh, is a simple example. And um, ideas are kind of an ephemeral, hard to capture notion. So what they really built was 
um, programming systems to deal with text. And they could use words to represent ideas the same way I'm doing right now. Um, and so uh, that was the beginning of Lisp. Um, John McCarthy, whom you saw in the first slide, uh, actually uh, designed the Lisp programming language, um, of which BYOB is sort of a descendant in a way. The scratch part isn't Lisp based, but the um, recursion and higher order function stuff is ideas that came out of Lisp largely. Um, Okay. Some other researchers. McCarthy was setting up this, this notion of symbolic computing. Other researchers at the same time were interested in trying to simulate the way the brain actually works. And they developed software simulations of neurons, which is what we're looking at here. These things are neurons, which are the fundamental building block in the brain. And each neuron is connected to other neurons um, with these kind of tendrils that you see um, uh, to form a network, which is called a neural net. Um, the neuron, what it basically does is it gets a bunch of inputs and it assigns a weight to each one, like this counts for three times as much as that, and then it adds them up um, and then based on the result, it either does or doesn't fire um, which means to send an output signal to whatever neurons come after it. So each neuron does something that's computationally very simple. And yet you put a lot of them together and you get your brain, which does computationally very amazing things. So in a computer simulated neural net, um, typically the neurons are arranged in layers. So some neurons get their inputs from an external source off on the left. So, you know, you're in, in a person it would be your eyes and ears and uh, your sense of touch and so on. Um, in a computer system it might be a TV camera um, or it could be a touch sensor and so on. Um, and those input neurons control uh, hidden layers, which are neither input nor output. Um, and there could be several different layers. In this picture, there's only three layers. So there are first level neurons, second level neurons, and third level neurons. Um, and you could imagine that you'd need you know, 20 layers to do something computationally interesting, but that turns out not to be true. Um, Two layers aren't enough, but three layers are to do a lot of interesting computations, it turns out. But that isn't a deep theoretical result. It just comes from a lot of experience. Um, in 1969, uh, there was a book called Perceptrons by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert in which they proved some theorems about limitations of neural nets. Uh, now, limitations doesn't mean that a neural net can't compute something. Neural nets, it turns out, are Turing equivalent, meaning they're just as good as any computer system and probably just, well, they are just as good as people because we are neural nets. Um, but that the level of complexity required for certain computations was more than people had hoped, that certain kinds of computations you, you, know, you needed deep networks for. Um, and this book, which is the first real uh, piece of um, mathematics about neural nets that proved limitations on it uh, gave rise to a huge wave of pessimism about neural nets uh, for artificial intelligence. Um, although in recent years, people have gone back and looked at the book again, and uh, although what the book says is still true, um, the pessimism that followed on that book may not really be warranted because the limitations are not quite as limiting as some people had feared. But in any event, the result of this was in the 1970s a virtual abandonment of research on neural networks. So all of the AI research used the symbolic logical 
uh, approach um, based on Lisp. And um, there were many early successes. Um, for example, computer chess is something that can be done entirely in a symbolic way. Um, uh, Terry Winograd, at, who's now at Stanford, was at MIT at the time, did um, a very successful program that could understand English that you type to it within a certain domain of discourse. It was You would give it instructions to a robot saying something like move the red block on top of the blue block or you know that kind of command and the system would figure out what you meant. Um, and that was a big advance uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. But then there was a period of stagnation um, in which uh, there weren't so, so much successes as before. And that was when people really started saying, oh, you know, AI is impossible. Um, computers aren't as smart as people, blah, blah. Um, and then what happened uh, in the 1980s and later, um, people have sort of combined the two approaches. Let me see if I can pull up the right window here. So... Um, this is a picture of handwritten zip codes. Um, it comes from a paper about the system that the post office uses to read zip codes, which is now as good as human beings. So there are certain situations that people, where the writing is such that people can't tell what's meant. So um, about halfway down on the right, is four something nine five eight. So is that a one with a little tail, a serif, or is that a seven? Probably a seven, but you know, I'm not, you're not sure, I'm not sure, and the computer isn't sure. Um, so that's the kind of situation in which computers mess up, but ones in which you can tell uh, what zip code it is, so can the computer system. So that's really very good. It, I mean, it doesn't seem like much, it's just zip codes, but um, it was a huge, huge advance. And it works by combining some formal uh, symbolic reasoning with a new approach, which is statistical uh, learning, in which um, you build something like a neural net, um, and you give it a ton of data. So instead of you deciding, how am I going to connect up this neuron to that neuron, and what weight should I give this or that? Um, you set up the system so that it can control its own uh, weighting factors. Um, so you give it some data, you give it handwritten zip codes, and it can see how it did, because you can tell it what the zip code really was, too, uh, you know, not handwritten. Um, and then it can say, oh, um, this combination of factors didn't do a good job. I got the wrong answer. So let me tweak it up a little and try something else. Um, so this is a, a statistical learning system. And a lot of uh, recent AI successes have been based on that model. Um, yeah. Well... This particular program that we're looking at here is all about zip codes. It's, it was done for the post office. Um, yeah. So handwriting recognition in general for letters and stuff is not quite as good. It's not 100% success rate. But if you have um, you know, a smartphone, um, you can write letters on it and it can more or less read your handwriting if yours is better than mine. Um, so it doesn't have the same kind of success rate. It makes mistakes. But there have been uh, advances beyond just digits, if that's what you're asking. Um, as far as you know, school applications, the right, you know, we, these days we just get you to type it in on a computer in the first place. Um, rather than try to do character recognition. But yeah, if you go out and buy a scanner, it'll come with um, 
character recognition software um, that does a fair job. Uh, I think it's fair to say that they're still pretty fragile. Um, like if the thing is tilted too much or there's a little smudge of dirt or something, uh, you'll be able to cope with that just fine, but the program won't do so well. Um, that's the state of the art in general character recognition. Do you have to talk about recaptures where people are using oh. Google Books can learn things? Oh, yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, right. So Dan is saying one of, the, one of the applications for character recognition is to try to get past um, captures, which are these things that when you want to sign up for a website or something, it'll say, okay, type this word in, and there'll be a word in sort of squiggly or smudged or faint characters that you have to figure out. Um, and they try to get it so that um, human beings can do it, but computers can't to avoid, you know, robot account generators um, used for spamming. Um, and these days, um, there's enough data around. That, so one of the things that, that we've learned fairly recently is that having more data sometimes beats having a better algorithm. Um, so there was a talk here last year by um, Peter Norvig um, at Google uh, on the subject of speech recognition. And he pulled out, he did some research about um, the different algorithms that people were trying, you know, in the 70s to do speech recognition and what their success rates were. And... Um, all of these systems were being tested on a database that had something like 100,000 words in it. Um, and Google, you know, has bazillions of words. Wait, it couldn't have been speech recognition because they used web pages. It must have been um, language understanding, parsing sentences. That's what it was. Sorry. Um, so Google has, you know, hundreds of billions, I think, of words uh, of data. So... Norvig took those old algorithms from 30, 40 years ago and just trained them on this massively increased amount of data. And the dumbest algorithm from back then was more successful on, the, on a lot of data than the smartest algorithm was on not so much data. Um, so that's something we're discovering, that data is really important. And this is... Um, Yes, yes, although um, for speech recognition, yeah, you could. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Or say stuff. You, you, probably you'd do it the other way around. The, the program would put a sentence up on the screen, and you would have to say that sentence. Um, and that's how, because it, it wants to get data about how different people say things. Right, it's easy to get, it's f relatively easy to get a system that works for one speaker. You know, but you want to get it to work for, you know, you can understand people with accents and people with speech impediments and all kinds of things that are just way beyond the capability of computers right now. So that's the kind of frontier of speech recognition. Um, okay, what haven't I said? Oh, yeah, I was going to talk about the people who think you can't do AI, um, briefly. Um, so two important critics of AI are actually here at Berkeley. Um, one of them is uh, Bert Dreyfus, whom I mentioned before, um, who has now conceded that computers can play chess. Um, but he still thinks that the fact that it's only because they got faster doesn't invalidate his argument. Um, which I'll tell you about in a second. The other one is John Searle, who has a kind of different argument. So let me see if I can really quickly summarize the arguments. Um, Dreyfus's argument really is not an argument against neural nets uh, or statistical models. It's an argument only against symbolic AI. And he 
basically he says, that's how people solve unusual problems, but it's really not how people think in general. And he's got a ton of information uh, showing how people don't think the way they think they think, um, of which my favorite is, um, it turns out when you learn to fly an airplane and you go into the airplane cockpit and there's like thousands of little dials, knobs, and uh, meters and things, um, they teach you a particular order in which to look at those. When you're getting ready to take off, you go in and you first you look at this, and then if that's okay, you look at that, and, and the whole thing. Um, and the flight instructors swear that that's the way they fly. And so somebody uh, mounted an eye tracker in one of these airplanes and had the flight instructor go fly them. And it turns out that what flight instructors actually do is nothing at all like what they teach beginners. Um, and Dreyfus's argument about that is not that they're teaching the beginners wrong. On the contrary, if you're a beginner, you do have to do it by learning rules about what to look at first. But if you're an expert pilot, you can look at the whole thing at once, and anything that's not right just jumps out at you. And much the same thing is true about uh, the way expert human chess players play chess. So a nice piece of research about that is um, you put some chess pieces on a chessboard, and you show it to somebody for a minute, and then you take it away and ask them to reconstruct the, the chessboard, which pieces are where. Um, people who are not chess players are uniformly terrible at this, as you might guess. Um, chess masters have the following interesting results. If the board position is actually part of a game that really happened, then a chess master can memorize it instantly and can, can reproduce it at will. If, the, if you put the pieces down on the board at random, then the chess masters are just as bad as the rest of us. And so the point is that chess masters are getting some kind of high-level uh, information about the structure of the game, about you know how did we get here and what's going to happen next. Um, in order to reconstruct the board position rather than just learn what piece is in what square. Um, and that's something that, that sort of learning at a glance is something that we don't understand very well at all, um, the holistic response to a situation. And we all do that. You don't have to be a master at something. Um, you know, if, um, I don't know, one of you pulled a gun out right now, I bet I'd notice. I bet I'd see who it was, you know. When something is unusual in a crowded situation, you, you kind of take it in right away. You don't have to go around and say, oh, now, is this, does you have a gun? No, do you, you know, it's not like that. Um, so Dreyfus argues that our ability to do that, to sort of take in a whole situation at once, comes from a style of thinking that is not rule-based, and that, therefore, rule-based approaches to artificial intelligence are only going to be good at things like playing chess, where you can make up for the lack of holistic understanding by being fast, and not going to be so good at things like walking, where you know, we really don't have any clue what the rules... Well, we do now, actually. People have thought about it a lot and do have some idea of what the rules might be, but it's really hard. And, and the, the rule-based systems don't work very well. Um, and so that's kind of Dreyfus's argument. Searle has a different argument. Um, and he has this famous metaphor of the Chinese room. And so here's the picture you have to imagine. Um, there's this room, and inside the room is the person. And the person has a whole library full of books that are like a... English Chinese dictionary. And so you type in a sentence in English, and this person looks up all the words and everything, and, and there's some rules about what word goes, you know, the word ordering in Chinese and so on. Um, and he puts together a Chinese translation. Um, 
and prints it out. Now, it's not absolutely clear that a sort of dictionary word-by-word -word translation is ever going to be very good. But never mind that. Let's say we get the rules so good that this room can translate English to Chinese perfectly. Searle wants to say the room does not understand Chinese or English. Because the guy in the room, he doesn't speak Chinese. He's just using these books to tell him what to do. So the guy doesn't speak Chinese. The room seems to speak Chinese, but you wouldn't want to say that the room understands. And Searle wants to say that that's true about artificial intelligence programs, too, that no matter how good they get, even if we get a perfect simulation of a human being, you know, we build robots that look like people and move around like people and do everything like people, um, he's still not going to want to call that an artificial intelligence because it doesn't have consciousness, because it's merely a system following rules. And he says that's true even if what we do is we do it by neural networks and machine learning and stuff because that isn't really a neural net inside the computer. It's a piece of software following rules that we programmed in. And so it's not conscious. Uh, it's not aware. It's not an artificial intelligence. So it's, it's an interesting argument. And what the AI people say about this... Um, well, two different things. With respect to Searle, the, the argument that AI people make is that Searle is confusing levels, that the man inside the room and the books inside the room don't speak Chinese, but the room does speak Chinese. That, in fact, the way people speak languages or any of the other things that we do is precisely by having some mechanism inside our heads that if only we could look at it with enough precision, we could make out the rules. Um, and we would want to say, well, that neuron doesn't speak Chinese, and that neuron doesn't speak Chinese. You know, well, this whole head doesn't speak Chinese, but English. That neuron doesn't speak English, and that neuron doesn't speak English. But you put them all together, and yes, they do speak English uh, with consciousness. I'm conscious. So, um, that's, so there's this argument about confusing levels, that Searle thinks that if the man in the room doesn't speak Chinese, then the room doesn't speak Chinese. Searle, who's not an idiot, has an answer to the answer. And I've heard him say it, but I don't understand it. So that's where I stand on that. Um, Dreyfus, it's very interesting years ago. When was Dreyfus at MIT? It was like 70-something. Um, some MIT AI grad students invited Dreyfus to give a talk at MIT. And he got into this famous shouting match with Jerry Sussman. Um, because they just, you know, did, we're not speaking the same language about how to critique the work of AI. But what's happened since then is that in a way the AI people have conceded Dreyfus's point without quite saying so. So AI people don't go around saying, yeah, Dreyfus was right. Um, but they're building systems that are not rule-based, are not entirely rule-based. Um, they're even some AI people talking about the importance of physical embodiment, which is a th an idea that Dreyfus got from um, Heidegger, that it really matters a lot in understanding how we think that we are in a body in the world, situated, you know, sitting down on a chair and feeling this hard table in front of me, you know, you know all of that stuff, that you can't have intelligence in a vacuum. It has to be embodied. And that's something that some of the robotics people are saying now, that um, they want to build robots because that's the way to get computers smart, is 
to have them dealing with sensory input and the need to balance themselves and, and move around. Um, and that's where the new breakthroughs in AI are going to come from. So at least some AI people have sort of taken Dreyfus's ideas to heart. Yes? So I think defining AI as making computers as much like humans as possible, so like, isn't it possible that AI could be something that's smarter than humans? Yeah, well, that wasn't the definition. McCarthy's definition was get computers to do things which, when done by people, are said to involve intelligence. Well, we, so, we don't even really know, like, we understand ourselves. That's right. That's right. So the AI view is, so what? If we can get the computers to do the job, it doesn't matter whether it's the same way people do it or not. One yeah, that's right. It, 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 that's right. There is a difference. So you're thinking now about Searle's argument about consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of AI people say, I don't care about consciousness, and they just go ahead and do the work. Um, Searle cares about it a lot, because, you know, it is an important point. How is it that we're aware of ourselves? What does that mean? And AI, it's not that AI people have nothing to say about that. There's a, a famous old paper by Marvin Minsky at MIT called Matter, Mind, and Models that raises this question of self-consciousness and consciousness. Um, but, you know, this was... 40 years ago, he wrote it, and he didn't have a lot of data to work with at the time, so it's largely speculative. Um, but that gets me into an important point, which is there are two different other kinds of work that have kind of grown out of AI, going in two different directions. One of those is um, something called expert systems, where the idea is not to simulate human beings at all, but to build computer systems that can solve um, well-defined problems. And the, a lot of the early work in expert systems was in medical diagnosis. Um, so you type into the program the results of you know, blood tests and things and what symptoms your patient has. And the program says uh, either, well, you know, I think your patient has less and such disease, um, or it says, okay, please do this test to distinguish between this and that. Um, and they found, by the way, an interesting thing about expert systems is it's really important for the program to explain its reasoning. And that was how they would get doctors to trust it. If you just said, you know, your patient has less and such disease, period, doctors would be skeptical. But if you say, well, because of this, this, and this, and not having that, that, and that, that shows, you know. Um, so they had to build into the system kind of remembering the history of its own reasoning. Yeah? Is this the way we think kind of rule-based, though? Like, instead of, like, we set a goal, and then we make our own algorithm for it. So it's like, a, it's kind of rule-based, but the rules change. Okay. We can, like, adjust that. So, so here's um, the canonical example from Heidegger about this. You have a hammer, and you're hammering a nail. You never think oh, this hammer is 13 inches long, so I should put my fist 13 inches this side of the nail. You just hammer, and it's as if the hammer were an extension of your arm. Bam. The time when you start doing rule-based thinking is if something goes wrong. So if you're hammering the nail and the hammerhead flies across the room... That's when you start reasoning. You say, well, let me see. What can I use to hold this on? Oh, I have some duct tape or, you know, whatever it is. That's when you reason in the way that the symbolic AI people want you to. But if things aren't going wrong, you don't reason like that. You just do. And you do it because of a kind of holistic um, reaction to the situation that just works, you know. It's like the, the other example that everybody gives is, um, when you catch a fly ball in a baseball game, you know, in a certain sense, you're solving differential equations, right, in order to get your hand in the right place. But, of course, catch, you know, no baseball players don't sit there solving differential equations. They just know where to put their hand and whether to run backwards or forwards, and they just do the right thing without any conscious reasoning at all. And so that's what Dreyfus thinks you have to 
capture in order to really get artificial intelligence. That the, the rule-based stuff is easy. It's the non-rule-based stuff that's hard. So I want to let me finish talking about the two branches. So one is expert systems. So there are lots of examples of expert systems in the world. It's a very mature, successful field. Um, for instance, the one everybody gives, uh, when you use your credit card um, and the bank is deciding whether to allow this transaction, depending on the exact system, sometimes there's a credit limit, but in some circumstances they'll let you go over the limit. Um, if it's an American Express card, you famously don't have a predefined limit. That's one of the things they advertise. They actually make each decision on the spot. But that, of course, doesn't mean a human being makes a decision. A computer makes the decision. Um, and they do that by an expert system. that has a bunch of rules built in, like if this person has paid all his bills on time for the last year and this purchase is no more than 20% over the limit and blah, 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 then approve it. That would be one rule. And there could be a whole bunch of other rules that would lead to approval by a different route. So that's expert systems. And those people are making no claims about being anything like human beings. Um, their work is entirely in the symbolic rule-based level. And um, they're pretty good at it for a limited domain of discourse. So you can build an expert system about something. It's, you, we don't have like general expert systems that are expert at everything. The other branch off of artificial intelligence, and this gets back to your question earlier, uh, is cognitive science. And cognitive scientists are trying to model human beings. Um, they have the view that human beings basically work like computers, more or less. Um, so, for example, a lot of cognitive, not every cognitive scientist, but a lot of cognitive scientists, uh, when you tell them about um, the chess player who takes in the board at a glance, says, oh, that's just rules that have been compiled. So when you compile a computer program, you're translating it from a language like Scratch to the machine's own native language of little teeny uh, operations. And it runs faster when you do that. So that's their metaphor for things that you can do at a glance. That You used to have rules, but you've compiled them. Um, drives me crazy when they say that, because I think it's totally wrong. But not all cognitive scientists talk quite like that. But what they do, for example, um, human beings have um, a, short -term, a small short-term memory and a large long-term memory. Uh, and your short-term memory... There's a lot of research about this. There's one famous paper that says seven plus or minus two things fit in your memory, in your short-term memory. Um, so, for example, um, this is why your seven-digit telephone number has a hyphen partway through. You know, three digits, hyphen, four digits. Um, it's because you can remember two chunks, a three-digit chunk and a four-digit chunk, better than you can remember a string of seven digits. Um, so that's an example of this research being applied. Well, cognitive scientists write computer programs that are artificially limited to that kind of short-term memory. I mean, computers' memories aren't really like that at all, but these guys want to write programs that behave exactly like human beings. Um, and so they build neural networks, and they build short-term memories out of neurons, you know, and so on, um, and try very hard to model how people think. Um, now, one interesting thing about how people think is that it takes us quite a long time to learn how to be autonomous people, right? We have childhood that lasts used to be 13 years in the ancient world, and, and then it became 18 years, and then it became 21 years, and if you go to grad school, it's like 30 years, you know. Um, and, um, and that's because your neural network really has a hard time learning all the stuff it has to learn. Um, it takes a long time to do that, and a lot of practice. Um, and so... Computers, the, the underlying speed of computer operations is way, way faster than people. 
You know, neurons, uh, neuron firing is something like, what is it, a tenth of a second or something on that order? Something like that. Some, by computer standards, incredibly slow thing. You can simulate a neuron at, you know, a billion operations per second. And so in principle, we should get to the point where computers learn faster than we do and think faster than we do. And, you know, we have great robots that are just like us, only way faster. Um, Nobody thinks we're anywhere near that stage. Uh, the robot people these days are very happy if they can build a robot insect, you know, that can walk along in irregular terrain. Um, or, you know, maybe build a robot dog is a, a difficult thing. If you, want, if you don't want to cheat and build sitting up and begging into it specifically, but you want it to have the capability of learning stuff like that, uh, I think that's beyond our capability right now. Um, okay, questions, other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so isn't human memory being in short and long term just like uh, cash in a computer? Well, yes and no. I mean, the cache in a computer, um, well, it's, it's a little bit like it. And the reasoning may be, may be the, 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 the sort of design reason for short-term memory in people may be the same as it wouldn't be so much cache as the registers on the processor chip. So you have like 32 or 64 registers that are part of the processor itself. And that would be like your short-term memory. A computer cache is, you know, measured in megabytes, um, which is way, way beyond human beings' short-term memory. Um, I don't think, I mean, people have short-term and long-term, and that's about it, unless you want to count pieces of paper as being kind of like disk. Um, computers have, you know, maybe two levels of cache, and then main memory, and then disk. So register, cache, cache. Memory disk is five levels of computer memory. Six if you count the backup system, disks or tapes or whatever you use. Um, so people aren't anywhere near that complicated. But yeah, it's true that it's a good metaphor, that the reason you have registers in the processor is the same reason people have short-term memory, that it's better connected to your processing centers um, and I know in the case of computer memory, it's more expensive to build. The faster the, the memory is, the more expensive. One more question. What? Nah, I want to answer that guy in the back. Yeah. Try really, okay. Searle acknowledges that you can build a smart system out of stupid components, and in fact, people are built like that. So Searle understands that the neurons in your brain are not conscious, even though your brain is. But He believes that if you could sort of open up your brain in the same way that you could open up his Chinese room, that you wouldn't find somebody obeying rules, that that, that just isn't good enough for you to call the system conscious. So when, imagine a future in which we know everything about the brain. We're still going to say people are conscious, right? I mean, we just are. Um, and so what we discover when we open up the box is not going to be disappointing in the way that opening up the Chinese room would be disappointing. Because it, you think that the Chinese room understands Chinese, and you open it up and you find that the person inside who does understand something doesn't understand Chinese at all, that he's just blindly following rules. And Searle says that blindly following rules even at a lower level, is not enough to call the system the results conscious. Yeah? Uh, like, for the person, is that a metaphor for, like, a single processor or something? Or? 
Oh, people actually are extremely parallel in, in the way we like process like cloud information. Well, we're not a cloud. I mean, we're not you know, hooked up on the network to other people especially. But um, for example, take vision. This is the classic example. Um, you don't see a scene by you know, scanning pixels. Um, in fact, what happens is a lot of the processing is happening in the optic nerve, in between the retina and your brain. So that by the time it gets to your brain, a big parallel network has already looked for features. It found you know, a certain color, a, a swash of color. It found vertical or horizontal lines, lots of things. It found circles. Um, and your brain gets this sort of chunked information. And then it does things in parallel with it. All the neurons in your brain are working all the time. So it's hugely parallel. Um, but the nature of the parallelism is pretty different from any particular computer parallel system other than simulated neural nets. Now, if you have a highly parallel computer system, then you can run a neural net simulation taking advantage of the parallelism. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, it's time to go.